The performance of our web applications is super important. It can be the difference between a user staying on or leaving a website as well as your ranking in a search engine. So how do you improve the performance of your websites? Well, you watch our next talk. Handy that, isn't it? Your next speaker at the 2021 CityJS conference is Alex from Bristol in the UK. Alex is a developer relations manager for Fidel and in this talk he promises no fuss, no frills, no slides, just live debugging of the website of your choice. Fantastic. If you have any questions about debugging, web performance or anything related, please do bring them along to the Q&A session which will be starting at the end of this talk over on Gathertown. Keep your comments coming in on YouTube as well as your tweets and other social media posts provided you use the hashtag CityJS2021. Without further ado, it is over to you Alex. Hi everybody. Hi everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to, to, to my talk. I'm Alex. I do a bunch of things in this world. One of which is I'm a developer advocate or a developer relations manager for Fidel. In case you haven't heard about Fidel, that's fine. Most people still haven't heard about us. We're an API company that does real time transaction uh, data. So whenever you go to a shop and swipe your card, we can get the data and pass it on to developers. After my talk, if you want to know more, you can find me on Twitter. But uh, today I'm here to talk about a different thing, and that's to show you hands-on how to debug a web. I'm gonna need I'm gonna need a little bit of help from you because uh, my alternatives are my own website, which I know exactly how how bad it is. Uh, but you have a little chat function in Gathered Town. So if you drop a link to a website you'd like me to live debug, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how to how to do that. And the reason I'm doing this is, for the past ten years I've been um, I've been developing for the web, on the web, with the web, whatever you want to call it. I still I think I still have some some uh, some code left over in the dev tools I'm using today, for example. And probably that's why I'm using Firefox over over Chrome because I'm sentimentally attached to the Firefox dev tools. Now there was a there was a time when they were considerably better than Chrome, but today, in this day and age, whichever one you choose, you choose because it's the tool, the right tool for the job. Whatever I'm showing you today in, in Firefox, you can you can replicate in Chrome as well. Um, so please go to, to, to get up down to the chat function and give me a link of a, of a website. Ooh, yes, Andre, ctjsconf or the ctjsconf. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's probably going to make Ari super happy that I'm debugging ctjs. Okay, perfect. Uh, city. So the schedule page, right? Debug. This is okay. This is a good page. So let's see. Let's see what's happening here. Let's look at some of the things I'm looking at when I debug website. So any any website right, has a few components that need to happen before it gets to your computer so you can start actually it. So before this whole website appears, I have to download it from somewhere to go get it from the internet. So let's call it internet, right? Um, and then it starts running in here. And that's when I start to notice the performance quirks. And then after it runs for a bunch of time, I can see how it performs if it stays open for like half an hour. I don't think the the schedule, for example, is something that people are going to keep open for half an hour. So probably the performance for that is going to be great. But some websites you're on, you always have open. So if, if I think about myself, I always have open one or three instances of Gmail, uh, my instance of Twitter, for example, and maybe some some of the other ones that are always open. Right? And that's because they're web apps, web apps more than websites. We're going to look at that, about that. But the very first thing I look at when I look at the website, so let's do a, a 
a hard refresh here, so a shift refresh. The very first thing I look at is the network bit, right? Because if it takes uh, if it takes seven seconds, or in this case nine and a half seconds for a website to load, right? I'll lose interest. Unless it's something that I really, really want, I won't stick around for 10 seconds, right? For this, for CTJS conf, well, you're in luck. You're kind of captive here. You want to go to the conference, you'll wait for the 10 seconds. If it's something else, you're going to look for a different service, for an alternate service. So, for example, one of the reasons I shop on Amazon and not on eBay is because the Amazon website is so much better than the eBay website right and things like that people are going to look for competitors so the very first thing i look at is this network tab because even before we can talk about everybody talks about javascript performance right well if your javascript is 47 megabytes and you need to download it it's not really performance that you care about it's that initial chunk of download now one of the one of the reasons this is this is a big deal is I live in England and I pay through the nose for a gigabyte, gigabyte of fiber. Not everyone has the same internet connection around the world before. The reason I pay for gigabyte fiber right now is I used to be on a really, really crappy provider before and internet for me in the house wasn't a thing until the pandemic hit and I was forced to improve my internet connection. I was surfing the net on 20 megabytes of internet. and I was happy with that. So slow websites, start here in this network tab of all the things you're trying to download before your your web page loads so if i look at this one i see quite a bit of quite a bit of things that are being loaded in the first let me try to show you more of this so uh, here it shows the timeline of exactly when things started I look at the ones that took the most, right? I look at the ones that took the most and I try to see why those took so long. One of the other things I look at, and it's basically the very first thing, I look at the transferred size instead of size in here, because the difference is transferred is the, the size of the request, the size of the, of, the, of the object I'm getting while it's in transit, and size is the size on disk it gets because most websites are going to use compression by default today all the engines out there have compression baked into it it's going to compress all the assets that it's sending send them across and i decompress them on my end now space isn't a big deal unless i need to download like if i need to download 100 megabytes right and then it ends up unpacking in a gigabyte maybe that's a problem but i can reduce the size on this by reducing the transfer size anyway and the transfer size is the only one that actually impacts speed the the decompression speed is quite fast. So I look at things in here that aren't compressed. So for example, in here, um, or places where I can, I can save on compression. So for example, these scripts, right? The compression rate is one to four, but if I look in here, that's one to five. So I could be, I could be looking at compressing my scripts better or stuff like that. For example, this one is quite a big one. That's a one to three ratio. I could look at compressing all my, all my assets better than this. So the, the transfer size is even, even smaller. Now I'm gonna look at one of the requests and see, uh, this is a font one, this is gonna be an interesting one. So I'm gonna look at individual requests and see how I can make them better. As soon as I click one of the one of the requests, it's gonna open up the side panel and I look in here at the, at the timings because the timings tell me where exactly have I lost time, right? So if I look at uh, of all the, 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 the steps in the timing, they mimic an HTTP request. What happens when you make an HTTP request? Well, it first goes to the DNS to figure out what ctjsconf.org actually means. It usually gets an IP address. It connects to that IP address. After it connects to the IP address, because this is using HTTPS, is doing the TLS setup. That's a handshake of back and forth. And it's usually going to be a multiple of connecting. And these two are closely related together. And I'll tell you why. Because it has to go back to the same server back and forth. The more it has to travel, it's, it's a myth, but internet connection, the internet connection, the, the actual connection travels from point A to point B through maybe 27 different networks. 
So the, the slower the network, so the bigger the difference it has to connect to, this time it's going to be bigger. The sending part, because it made the request a get request, is virtually zero. It's basically one line saying, hey, I want this resource. So the sending part isn't important for get request. For post requests, where you're actually sending data or when you complete forms and stuff like that, that's when you call API, that's usually when you send post requests. That when you send a lot of data, that's when this request, the, the sending part starts to impact. So for this one, for get request, not important. For send request, very, very important. Then it waited around for almost two seconds. And that's because it waited around on the server. The server probably has so many connections that it can't fulfill all of them in a split second. So you get on a queue on the server, you wait until the server replies to you, and then you start downloading the reply. For this one, it was 10 kilobytes of data. I mean, 11 kilobytes of data, it wasn't that big of a request. If you look at it compared to the 1.5 megabytes, right, it wasn't that big of a request. And the reason why this is happening, why the waiting and the receiving part for this particular request is so different than the, the other ones is because it's going to fonts.googlestatic.com instead of going to ctgsconf.org. So one of the simple fixes here is to download all the fonts so they run off the same in, in the same place as your, your website, right? And that's because you're in here, you are depending entirely on a third party resource, which let's just assume because it's Google Fonts, it won't die tomorrow, right? If it's a different third party, you might end up assuming it might go away tomorrow, but you can download this on your own website. And then this whole part, it depends on your own server and you can fix it. Because right now, if you wanted to decrease the waiting time, you'd have to add more resources to that server so it can reply to you faster. You can process all the requests faster which you can't exactly add third party, but if it's on your, your server, you can fix all that and you can decrease this waiting and receiving size for all the requests at the same time. So this is one of the, the very first things I do. I look at all the, all the scripts that don't go to your own domain, bring them down to your own domain so everything gets served from, from something you control. Now, if you look at this, the connecting part and the TLS part is quite big because the Google Fonts thing is a free service. It doesn't run around the world. If you have the same problem with your server, it means your server is big enough. Your, your server is big enough that it, it lives on halfway around the world. If you put your, your things on a CDN, CDN gets distributed across the world. You don't have to go, for example, I'm, I'm in Bristol, right? If I want to get resources from a US server or from Amos, AWS, US, an S3 bucket in the US, I have to go via Frankfurt. Frankfurt gets a hop through the ocean to somewhere in the US. And if I'm lucky and I'm in the same coast, it's good. If I'm on the San Francisco side, I have a 50-50 split chance of actually going through it the other way around, getting through Europe via Asia and San Francisco. So it's always a toss, but having things in Frankfurt on a CDN, on a European data server, amazing. It decreases this whole time for all the requests I'm making. Now the DNS resolution is actually quite fast, which is good. What I'm not particularly happy about is this blocked time. And the reason this, this blocked time appeared, this isn't something to do with the HTTP request or with the nature of the HTTP request itself. This has to do with the browser. So your browser blocked the connection for half a second before it started doing the whole thing. And that's because it had too many connections and it couldn't deal with all of them. Now, browsers used to have a limited, a finite number of connections they could be doing at the same time. And that used to be six of them. Now that, because this is using HTTP2, that's changed a bit. So for HTTP1 requests, yes, you only have a certain number of connections you could be having at the same time. Now it's changed a bit and you can have only a certain number of connections through multiple websites. So if everything is on the same domain, for example, on ctgs.org, on ctgs.org, ctgsconf.org, if everything is in there, you can use the same connection for everything. You don't have a limit of six connections, but you can only have six active websites at the same time. It means for this one, there's more than six different domains being accessed. 
So this was the seven, for example, and it stayed in a queue until one of those slots became available, right? And by looking at, at the request, I can make sure everything else kind of falls in line. For, for example, from this one, I can shave a good two seconds just by putting more than two seconds, just by putting all the requests on my on my server. And if I look at the the total load time, 10 seconds, right? I shave 20% of, of my website's load performance. By looking at some of the other big offenders, so for example, this one had the bigger waiting time. Um, this that's because it goes to YouTube to catch to get the player, the player JavaScript from YouTube. And this one, this one goes for that as well. By by downloading this JavaScript, and that's like I, I spent quite the same amount of time for this one, um, and and the second one. This one was eight kilobytes, and I spent roughly the same amount of time for the one point point five megabytes of, of data being being brought here. So by putting these scripts, because it's JavaScript, right? I don't need it to be hosted on a third party website. I can host it on my own. I can download this and post it on my own. I, sh I shave another good six seconds out of, out of the entire ordeal. And these are probably the biggest offenders to make this load in under two seconds. Now, for static websites, for example, my own website or this one, because it doesn't have a lot of interactivity or a lot of things being loaded, right? For a static website, you kind of want it to load for a, around two seconds. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of anecdotes out there that say if it's under two seconds, people won't think they got the website. They think they got the tech cast, so they do what I usually do, and I shift to refresh, or I force refresh the website, and that's quite quite usually the case. So you would want to to, to keep your loading between one and two seconds, right? One and two seconds is, feels instantly, but ten seconds on the other height. On the other side, not a great, not a great amount. So going and figuring out which one load from which domain and trying to bring everything on ctgs.com.org, quite a, quite a bit of domains, would be the very first first step I do, and that would shave a lot of that would shave a lot of problems. Now looking at the looking at the transfer size, I don't see a lot of discrepancies between the let's see uh, the biggest offenders in here. I don't see a lot of uh, a lot of places where the the size stays exactly the same, and that's because it uses compression everywhere. So I don't have to worry about uncompressed resources. I just have to figure out a better compression system because these are being compressed in different in different parts of the of the internet. The compressions the, the compression ratios of them differ. If you compress them all with the same algorithm, the compression ratios will stay the same. You've seen that. Images, for example, can't be compressed, and that's because you get what you get. There's no, there's no white space in there to compress to begin with. But I like the fact that the images aren't quite big, like a hundred and something kilobytes for images, not the big, not the big thing. Um, the um, the Firefox, the Firefox uh, network network inspector also has this little icon in here that shows you this was a slow request so it's easy to, to see that the biggest offenders in here uh because it so shows you the response time so if i the um like the turtle in here corresponds with that with the receiving bit so the ones that have a big receiving bit are going to show up as the as a little turtle right so i figured out how to how to make it smaller the images i probably would lazy load them um, instead of instead of loading everything in one go, so those would show as deferred after the initial load. The the load here would keep bumping up and up and up and up as the images get loaded, but the DOM content loaded initial the initial bit would be the first request I make. The first request I make brings me the HTML DOM content loaded files without having to, to wait for the images and the, all the other requests. So it would decrease considerably. Now, what happens after I've done all this, right? I've made my website 80% faster. And usually that's all it takes, right? If I made this 80% faster, I don't have to bother with anything any anymore. It's two seconds, that's it. If your website is slow or if your website has a lot of JavaScript on it, that's where the, the JavaScript performance optimization begins. Um, I've got a separate tag tab for it called performance. And what this does is I can record my performance fluctuation on a web 
site. It's not on by default. Like it's not on by default because on itself, the fact that the performance recording is happening is gonna affect my performance of the website. But I can start the recording. It grabs a snapshot of what I did and it shows it to me step by step. Now, um, why would I why would I do that? One of the good reasons why I like doing this is you won't get the same performance twice. You run the same websites a minute apart, the performance is gonna fluctuate a bit. So what people do is they they record the performance three times, seven times, depending on how much statistical significant or statistical relevance you want. So you record this this multiple times, and then you'd see out of those recordings the things that are common between them and not the things that were just flukes or your laptop was overheating and it affected your performance. So you record more than once. Now because I am really, really lazy, I'll record just once and you'll have to you'll have to record the other three times on your own. Uh, one of the other good things is I can import and export a recording so I can use the same with the entire team instead of us all getting slightly different results because different hardware, different internet connections, slightly different results. We can all record that on a benchmark machine and use the same recording to, to debug. So I'm gonna start recording. I'm gonna scroll for a bit until I get here. And then I'm gonna hard refresh this. You can see my, my frames per second dropping there. And I'm gonna stop recording my performance after I think it's loaded. Good. So I've got two, I've got two ways in which this performance, the, the, the JavaScript on the page was, was affecting my performance. The bit up until here, I think I had uh, 22 minutes, 20 minutes of the website being, being open. So I was running JavaScript on it, whatever JavaScript was there for 20 minutes, right? This is kind of the um, the spot where most websites drop off. I, I've been on your website for about 20 minutes, I'll probably go away, unless it's one of those web apps that's always open, right? So about here, most people drop off. So you need to make sure your performance is good up until here for certain types of website. For example, a conference schedule. Yes, I can see myself seeing being on the conference schedule for 20 minutes trying to figure things out. If the performance in 20 minutes wasn't noticeable, de noticeably degraded, it's all good. So if I look at it, all the fancy JavaScript that it's running in here co intervals and with intervals and timeouts, I can see exactly where it starts from. Uh, this is, the, um, this is the, the YouTube JavaScript. So you can't really do a lot of things for this one, the, for the YouTube, YouTube JavaScript, right? Embedded player from... Um, from YouTube, you can't do a lot of things in, with, with this one because it's third party code. If it would be your, your own code, I would start clean, clearing these intervals. There's no reason to have like eight or nine intervals at the same time. And that's because intervals can be, intervals and, and timeouts can be cleared. If you don't clear them, they kind of stay in memory and they affect your performance. Um, I've got a minor garbage collection happening. That's good. I want to see uh, as, as much minor garbage collection happening. I don't really want to see the other type. The garbage collection is with red. If I look at the garbage collection, uh, there's multiple types of garbage collection. The minor one is incremental. The minor one doesn't, doesn't really affect performance, but this one, the cycle, um, cycle collection graph reduction, JavaScript kind of expands outwards because you don't delete your object, for example. If you don't, if you don't use an object, if the JavaScript loses reference to an object, it won't clear it out of memory. It can't garbage collect it unless you use the delete keyword. So I'd strongly suggest you use the delete keyword and that keeps track of everything you do in JavaScript. And it's gonna force, if you don't do that, JavaScript eventually keeps hold of those objects and the memory gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it can't fit anymore. And so JavaScript looks at that graph of objects interconnected and tries to snip them at certain intervals, trying to reduce it. And that kind of takes time, especially if the graph is big, that's gonna take time. Now, the worst offenders when it comes to cycle collection graph reductions are JavaScript frameworks. Because they're so big, not everything they do is properly deleted. When you use them, 
you won't properly delete whatever needs to be deleted and that, and that's the biggest that's the biggest offenders i'm gonna guess i'm gonna guess i use some sort of a framework for this one mm, was it angular probably anyway so if it's if it's some sort of framework you're gonna see a lot of, of these cycle collection draft reduction but you don't want to deleting or properly deleting your memory your memory will help with with these and you don't want to see those there's a lot of dom events happening and that's probably because i scrolled and some sort of scroll handler is logged in there so um whenever i scroll the page javascript bubbles up which if i look at it there's quite a few bubbling so it captures it it captures it here and then it bubbles uh, it bubbles one level i would try to i would try to, to to get that bubbling down so the scrolling event should only should only happen where i need it to not throughout my my whole dom and using prevent default and things like that will make your javascript event handling a lot more clean a lot cleaner in here now you want to see as little as as these as possible so for example for one event for one event i got for one scroll event i got three things in my in my um, javascript performance i'd like to see one of it possibly that means i've probably got button over layout over main page and i'm tracking that for some reason the main page can can keep track of it i don't need to keep track of it, of it at, at button level right um this is this one's interesting i don't usually see recalculating style Recalculating style happens a lot. So if you look in here, the the, the style bit are uh, violet, and they kind of happen at intervals here. That tells me there's some sort of slider animation CSS happening on the page. When I load a new page, a lot more of this recalculating style is, is happening. This usually happens. So if I look at this after I've loaded the page, a lot of recalculate style happens, applying style changes and layout shift and that's because new css comes in the page gets gets applied to the to the dom the dom needs to, to be repainted the page needs to be repainted with a new styles if you've got seven different css files all competing with each other you're gonna see styles being recalculated constantly that takes up memory and time you should Try to use some sort of tool that makes your CSS as optimum as possible. As somebody who hand writes CSS without the framework, that's easy. I don't have to worry about bootstrap or tailwind or whatever, having a lot of things I don't need. I'm using a subset of it, which keeps competing with what I've got. But if you're using a framework, same way Webpack kind of shakes your CSS tree away, and you only use the JavaScript you need, you can only use the, the CSS you need. It's not as for the tools for CSS are not as popular as this one. Um, but if you Google Google search it, you'll see Huijing um, having a lot of uh, having a lot of, of CSS knowledge, which you can borrow to make your CSS as um, as optimum as possible. And then you won't keep seeing this while it renders. One of the noticeable things you're doing something that's not quite perfect with your CSS is when you scroll or when the page loads, you see a white flicker. And that's when the layout shift happens. This layout shift happens. There's also the, the white flicker happens from a, a little green dot called paint. I think this is literally the very first website I've I've done this on. So I've done this, I've done this, this live debugging bit. Um, on a few websites. I think this is the very first website where I don't see the repainting bit. And that's great because it means the, the, the layout and everything else isn't as broken to require a fresh repaint of the entire page. It updates styles where it needs to, but it's not that bad that it needs to, you know what, throw everything away, start over really fast. And that's when that white flash happens usually. For example, my website still has that white flash that says, hey, you, you're doing something incredibly wrong. I, I can't figure out what you want. The browser just chucks away what it has and starts over. And that's when you see when you see this frames per second dropping. So in here, when you've got this little bit, it means it had so much processing to do, it couldn't keep 60 frames per second as I was scrolling. That's why you keep looking in here for these dips 
For example, is you, you don't want to see the dips. I was scrolling a page. Somehow scrolling a page shouldn't affer, uh, affect my performance. If you've got all of those animations coming at me, the browser is quite good at rendering 60 frames per second. In here, I wasn't as, as great because this request frame, for example, too many animations happening at the same time, not all of them on screen. I mean, literally I have, I can see 20% of the screen and if my my performance drops under 60 frames per second in 60 frames, like under in under 20%, it means way too many animations off screen, which still need to be rendered. The problem is there's animation frameworks out there that don't need to render things that aren't on the screen. So you can optimize in there. But let's just assume you got this, you got this JavaScript bit as low as you possibly could. I'm really, I'm really happy the, the minor garbage collection is happening here and there's not a lot of cycle collection happening. Um, for example, this one, cycle collection and graph reduction. I'm happy that's not happening more throughout the website. It's happening just literally after load a little bit and every few seconds while I'm scrolling. So it's great. You've got your website that I've been on it for 20, 25 minutes now, and the website still performs admirably, right? What happens after this? If the website doesn't perform really well after like 20 minutes, it's because literally there's too much JavaScript on it. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. There's too much of everything on it because JavaScript doesn't just affect itself. It affects the DOM, it affects the CSS being applied, so they all work together. What happens if I wanna see what's my biggest offender? After half an hour of scrolling, I'd like to see what do I need to reduce to make it even faster or to help it perform better after half an hour. So if I look at if I look at Twitter, for example, right? My Twitter is open 24-7. And when when I started using Twitter, I need to close down the tab every couple of hours maybe. And that's because there wasn't really good at performance. And every couple of hours I had to close the tab to so the browser dumped everything about the tab and I had to reopen it. No, it's actually quite good. And that's because there's a second component to your to your website that you don't really see behind the scenes and that's in memory management if i look at the memory um the memory tab there's no way to actually see my memory in real time i need to take a snapshot of it of whatever is in memory now i make a copy i take a snapshot and i can inspect that in the next 10 seconds, this snapshot is gonna look slightly different because JavaScript keeps running. I told you about all the, those objects that keep piling up. So let's take a snapshot and see how my memory looks like right now. Ooh, that's quite a big one. Usually when I take a snapshot, the that's a, that's a big snapshot. So 37 megabytes is quite, quite a big snapshot. That's how much memory I'm using right now to process everything that's happening on the website, right? If I look at the, the amount of data I downloaded in the network tab, uh, am I gonna stop my share now? Hopefully I'm not gonna stop my share. Yeah, so if I look at the, the amount of data I, I got, is I, I got five megabytes of data on this, right? Those five megabytes of data kind of multiplied themselves in memory because nobody, no one was, was taking care of that delete keyword, for example, or anything else really to, to manage memory. Let me get this down. So that's gotten to 37 megabytes after 10 minutes. After only 10 minutes, it got to 37 megabytes, right? And that's because a lot of the things in memory kind of balloon in here. For example, the strings bit, unless you're generating new strings, for example, example, you have a chat feature or whatever. It didn't look like the, the website was that interactive. So the strings bit remains constant. The scripts bit as again, unless you're loading JavaScript on the fly, which very, very few websites load JavaScript on the fly, it's gonna keep the same. Now the bits that balloon are the, the DOM node and the object bit. Um, the, the other for me is a mis mixed bag because in here, in the other, basically the browser chucks everything that it doesn't really understand. 
So for me, I've got my browser running some JavaScript that gets chucked in here because it runs on the page. I've got my HTML uh, extensions that I that I keep around, like Grammarly, for example, and my mind, which affect every page and gets chucked in here. And they usually the, the other bit I quite ignore. But the, the ballooning bit and the bits that I care about are the DOM node and the object. The DOM node, whenever you create HTML object in your DOM, they get chucked in here. Even when you remove them, they get chucked in here. So for example, accordions or things like that, where you create things on the fly and you hide them and you put them back afterwards, not the greatest bit. So for example, this, because I stayed on one page, the DOM node wasn't problematic. If I went and switched to multiple pages, like on Twitter, for example, because it's one giant PWA, um, so it's a web app, it doesn't actually change DOM. It's the same DOM that, that keeps being added and taken out of, so the DOM node will balloon. If you're doing that, that page refresh you actually have on, on PWA is really good to clear some of that memory out instead of just running in the same tab, same frame without, like you'll see the, you'll see the URL changing, but that's because of the, of the, the, the big thing they have with the history API that changes the URL for you. You won't actually go to a different page. And that's when the DOM node starts ballooning. For this one, you didn't see that because I can go to seven pages, it's not the web app. It's a website, right? But the object bit, because of that much JavaScript running, that's the biggest, the biggest thing in here. And if I look at it, I think most of this JavaScript bit comes from the, from the, um, from the YouTube embeds, right? And that's what keeps multiplying and multiplying here. I, I didn't even press play, like I didn't even press play on the YouTube embed. One, one way to get rid of this, for example, would be to hide my my YouTube embed to actually be a static image. When I click on it, the JavaScript gets out of the, the page and it starts behaving like it would, like it, it's an actual player. If you go to, to Netflix, for example, or if you go to YouTube, they both use the same trick of it's a static image and until you want to play it, it doesn't actually switch up with the player. Instead, their embeds, for example, are the player by default. And when it's when it's smacked down in the middle of the page and really, really important to your page, sure, have the embed there. Probably most people are gonna click on that embed in the first 10 seconds they, they're on the website. Me, as much as I like Dimitra, I didn't write, quite click the embed for like half an hour, 40 minutes already, right? So I didn't really interact with the embed. It could have not even been there and it would have saved this massive object chunk and, and wouldn't be here. Now you'll see in here, I only have one, one document and that's because the document hasn't been reloaded in any way or destroyed in any way. And websites that do painting or flashing or whatever, you'll see a bunch of green bits in here when websites do that. The document is gonna balloon and you're gonna have more than one document because it had to be chucked away and started from scratch, uh, from scratch. Okay, I feel like I've been talking for quite a while. And um, while it's been amazing debugging the debugging the CTJS website, I just like to say it wasn't a bad website at all. It could be better, all websites could be better. But the point here is, you know how to, you know how to, to figure out what's wrong with a website, you know how to fix it. I'd ask you before you start doing all this, figuring out every step of what they showed you, is it worth it? The network bit, I think it's the most important bit. You can get away with a lot of what you need by just fiddling with this. And if you think about it, it's not web, for, it's not web development. You're not writing JavaScript for it or whatever. You're just improving, optimizing the way your website gets served to the browser. And that's what, what I used to, I used to obsess about the performance bit. I think most of my websites were the most performance, performance in, 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 in terms of JavaScript, right? And I poured over these micro performance optimizations to get a split second faster because I'm using inverted force, for example, right? And I, I just ignored this because as a web developer, it wasn't my business. It was my, 
um, it was the, the problem of the DevOps team or the problem of the whatever CDN. We weren't using CDNs. It wasn't my, my bit, right? I was doing JavaScript. I was that, that was my bit. And I didn't really care about it. So no matter how much, so no matter, no matter how much I, I, I used, I used to improve the, the performance of the middle part, I was keeping the most important one. So I, I, before I leave, I ask you to think about what you need to improve, think about what's worth improving at this stage. And um, hey, if you really need to go here and improve the memory and your website is a, is a single page application that's open for like six hours at a time for a user, yes, perfectly go there. But if you're, if you're writing a, a static website or if you're doing your personal blog, for example, there's really no, no not worth going all the way here. I think uh, my magic my magic voice in, in my headset said we've got five minutes of Q and A, um, so I'll leave you all here and uh, I'll meet you in the um, I'll meet you in the in the Q and A section in in about a minute. Thank you so much. If you've got questions, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitter, right? If you've got questions, I'm always on t Twitter. Feel free to drop me, uh, drop me a message. I've got open DMs. And if you want me to do this exact thing on your web for myself or whatever, so you can you can learn from it, drop me a message, and I'll I'll be more than glad to to do this for your website. Thank you very much for that session, Alex. We can consider our performance bottlenecks debugged now. That was really, really good stuff. Thank you very much for delivering it as part of today's conference. I'm sure everybody at home will be joining me to give you a huge around the world round of applause. Our Q&A with Alex will be starting over on GatherTown any moment now. So if you have any questions about debugging performance bottlenecks, this is the perfect opportunity to put them to Alex directly. Head on over to GatherTown and have your questions at the ready. Not on GatherTown? Don't forget, you can post along on social media using the hashtag CityJS2021. We love reading all of your tweets as well as all of your comments, which you can keep on posting over on YouTube. He looks so official when he does that, doesn't he? Oh. Alex, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much for being a part of this year's conference. It was a pleasure to have you here tearing the conference website apart. I love it. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a common occurrence. At least, at least yours performed really, really well. I was on a, I was on a different conference in de December. One of the attendees wanted me to do the, the conference website. Yeah. And I tried to, like, I tried to steer away that had the same like you had a, a, a youtube embed right they had the whole gather town embedded inside the website it was bad it was so so bad wow it was so so bad and i i kept having to, to find excuses of why it was okay to do it this way it wasn't that bad it wasn't that it was, it was, so the the, the, the city js website was actually a pleasure to a pleasure to, to debug it was good I mean, folks watching along at home, he's saying that now, but at the next conference, he'll be like, I did this CityJS conference and oh. <laughs> you, you've, you've noticed I haven't actually said the name of the conference. So if you want to go and check out what conference I was doing in December, you can figure it out. You can figure <laughs> it out, but I didn't say the, the conference name. But yeah, CityJS is going to be a, I'm going to talk so much about it this year. <laughs> perfect, perfect. There's those marketing miles we like. Um, so we've had a few questions come in, but I have a very quick one um, of my own, um, which um, I wondered if you'd be able to answer. If someone is comfortable building websites, but they've not looked at this performance stuff, where is the 80-20 in this? What should they be looking at? Is it as simple as optimize your images and then worry about everything else another day? So I, I worry about the network, the network performance more than anything else these days. And that's because that's the 8020, right? If you're building a website and you don't really write JavaScript, don't need a lot of JavaScript performance optimization. So the image optimization, 
not, not, not the biggest win you've gotten there, but things like, uh, how, where do I host my website, right? So for example, mine is hosted on Netlify and it's a $5 extra to put it on the edge or to keep it in one location, right? I pay the $5. It's like, instead of, of obsessing for hours on my JavaScript to make it faster, I pay the $5 to be on the edge. And that's, that's fixed most of my issues because I don't go to the US to grab my website, right? I grab it from Frankfurt, it's instantaneous, right? If, if I've done that and I've put it on the edge, I, the fact that my images are 100 kilobytes or 300 kilobytes isn't as important anymore because I don't have to wait for them two seconds to come over. You've seen on the CityJS website, the, the, the third party fonts, I was waiting for two seconds to come over. I can fix that by putting them the same hosting my website, right? And if you look at mine, not even the analytics script is going from Google. I downloaded my analytics script, I host my own analytics script. Every now and then when Google releases a new version of the analytics script, it gets re-downloaded that to my GitHub and, and it goes live, right? So things like that, that, that do with the way you deploy a way you deploy your website. I think those are important. And traditionally that does have to do with web development, right? Especially in, in this day and age when you have a DevOps, uh, an entire DevOps team focused on on this just this it's another set of tools to learn as a web developer like mm. i used to do devops but now i kind of have to figure out how to use aws and the buckets and everything else to serve my websites the best way right so yeah. that's that's i think that's where the 80 20 wins most of them come from perfect i mean that was the perfect answer there um, so let's rattle through these questions there's quite a few come through so let's start at the top um is deferred loading preferred over the new attribute loading lazy can you, can you repeat that for me please yeah sure is I, I deferred, just... um is deferred loading preferred over the new attribute loading equals lazy the lazy loading attribute doesn't work in all browsers. So if you've got lazy loading, if you've got lazy loading working for your browser, I'd use the lazy loading instead of the deferred one. Because what lazy does is it waits until it waits until everything else is loaded and then it starts loading lazy. So you've got the, the first the time to interaction decreases considerably. Deferred doesn't actually do that. Deferred just push it, pushes it as low in the queue as it can until it gets to the bottom of the queue, right? Lazy takes it outside of the queue and the queue becomes smaller. So I'd use lazy if I could. That's why I'm using lazy loading for, for images, for example. I don't really need to be the images to show up on initial load, right? It's okay if they load half a second after I can scroll through the website. That's fine with me. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, so any tips on generating a weekly performance report and they've specifically mentioned web vitals. Um, so, so I, I actually I actually have web.dev on a web.dev on on a on a Selenium script. But if you've got another service, that's fine. Uh, mine is I go to web.dev, I inspect my website, and I get so after you do that, you, you get the report link. I get that sent to me every week, so I can actually track and see what I because. In a perfect world, you track the performance immediately after the deploy, right? You, you, you want to deploy this, you track the performance of it first and you'd see it impacted. And that would do that if, I, if my website had a million viewers or a million users or whatever, right? Yeah. My personal blog for that one, I maybe deploy three times a week depending on what I want to do with it. For example, I changed Last week, I changed my social images. I, re I really wasn't paying attention. But like three days later, when web.dev ran, I actually messed up my performance and I had to go back and fix it, right? <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. But for, for, for other websites, yeah, uh, putting it as a deploy step, I think that would be the, the, the perfect thing to do. Okay. Um, so the next question was, which metric do you use to assess to determine the general website load time, e.g. DOM content loaded or any of the Lighthouse tools, for example, you know, the metrics that they measure, which which one's the most important one when we're looking at website time to load interact time? with. Time to interact. Okay. As the most important one. Because I might have 
a valid reason for 40 megabytes of JavaScript to load. And that will take time, no matter how I do it, what I do with it. But my website being frozen until those 40 megabytes of JavaScript loading, that's a bad one. So time to interactive, time to when I can start scrolling and those, I've, so I've showed you the, the CTGS website, that big gap in the 60, 60 frames per second. And that's because I had hard refresh and then it was unusable for a good three seconds, right? Mm -hmm. That's making that a small, even if it's a blank page, I can scroll, it's still interactive, right? So getting time to interactive as, as low as possible, that's a performance website. Sounds perfect. Um, like I know so what I'm talking about. <laughs> almost, almost, <laughs> almost, mate, almost. almost. Um, so we've got a follow-up question on that. Um, do you use the performance APIs? The one in the browser. So the problem with the performance APIs, um, it affects that are, it affects its own performance. The moment you, you've you've used something simple or as console time, and that time start and time end, that affects its own performance. So I try when I do my JavaScript performance to do it externally and not inside my code. The problem is I can see a piece of code that's misbehaving. When I actually start fixing that piece of code, I need to time it inside, right? So that's when I use the, the performance API. But for my production or for my debugging bit, before I start fixing it, it affects its own performance. So I can't really, adding performance timings would make my entire website slower just because I'm debugging this little piece of it. Okay. That's, I mean, that's a perfect way to use it. I guess anything you add, yeah, it makes sense that anything you add to your web page is going to make it go slower, whether you intend it to or not. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I think we've rattled through the questions. Uh, okay. Fetch polyfill from YouTube on Firefox. And this will need to be a quick answer. Um, fetch polyfill from YouTube on Firefox. Why did you decide, why did YouTube decide it needs it? That is a valid question. I'm going to ask the YouTube people when I, when I see them next. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a very valid question. Thank you. Um, no, seriously, I'll, I will ask the, the YouTube people next time I see them. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll eventually get the answer for that. Perfect. And where can people find you on Twitter? What's your username? Uh, my, my last name is 88. So it's at Lakatos 88. No, the name isn't, um, isn't Greek, even though I know Aris, the name isn't Greek. And every time I go to, to Greece, everybody starts talking Greek at me, which is cool <laughs> and interesting. Sadly, I don't, I don't speak any, uh, but you can, you can find me there on, on Twitter. Excellent. And just to wrap this up, we've got some rapid fire questions that we are using to survey the state of the developer ecosystem. So we don't want to leave you out with those. And we'll start with the most important one, tabs or spaces. Spaces. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen this with Sean earlier in the, in the, in the morning spaces. Spaces. Okay. I, I was, I was, I was scared of the rapid fire round. I was scared <laughs> of the rapid fire. Spaces. Um, React or Vue.js. Neither, but if I if I really had to choose one, I choose Vue. Okay. And Angular that, is still my first love. Angular. Okay, I should be slipping that in there. It always slips from my mind. Angular. Didn't you know, <laughs> forget it's still going sometimes. Um, Dino or Node? Do I need to be politically correct? No, no, no. I've, I've used no more in the past. No, actually, I, I quite like I quite like Dino. It just because it comes from the same place as Node, right? It, it's really hard to adopt it on the spot. And I think I'm I'm waiting to see it's actually different yeah. before before I fall in love. Okay, and this one's just for you: web page speed test or Google Lighthouse? Lighthouse. Lighthouse. Okay. And finally, apples or bananas? Both. Both. Oh. Yeah, you can't have a fruit cocktail, my friend. You've got to pick one. Okay, so if I had to, uh, I had bananas today. I had bananas today. Literally, the only two foods in the house are apples or, and, and bananas. So either of them is fine. But 
but I, I did have a banana this morning, so I'm going to go with banana. We can go one higher than that. We had banana fritters for breakfast. Well, some of us did here on the AVT. Oh. Deep fried bananas for breakfast. Yum, 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 yes. yum. Alex, it has been a pleasure to have you be a part of this year's conference. I could sit here and talk to you about um, page speed for hours and hours and hours, like literally. Um, thank you very much for being a part of it. It's been a pleasure to sit here and have a chat with you as well as to watch your talk. I'm looking forward to going back and watching it fully when I can concentrate. Have you got any final thoughts that you would like to leave our audience with? Uh, no, I'd, I'd hope your audience had enough it's been an amazing conference and i'm the i think i'm the only thing staying between them and lunch at this point um yeah thank you for having me it's been it's been really really great thank you so much and thank you for letting me deface your website live <laughs> excellent alex it's been a pleasure see you at the next conference i guess thank you bye these